Welcome, everyone, both in the room and those who are watching the, uh, the webcast. This, as I think everyone knows, is the sixth and last of the special events associated with the copyright course here at Harvard and with the corresponding Copyright X course being offered online. The topic for this evening is the relationship between copyright law and libraries, an issue that perhaps once upon a time would have been regarded as exotic or marginal, but now is actually of critical importance, not just to librarians and students, but to the world at large as online collections of materials become ever more crucial to education of all sorts. So we have um, two uh, extremely well-qualified speakers to address this issue. Both of them I've known for quite a while, and it's especially gratifying to me personally to have them here. Uh, so the first is going to be Bob Darkman. He is currently the director of the Harvard University Libraries, as well as the Carl Forsheimer University professor. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, as well as a trustee of the New York Public Library. Uh, I think the largest public library outside of perhaps the Library of Congress in the world. He is an historian by background, went to Harvard College, and then as a Rhodes Scholar went to Oxford, got his MPhil and DPhil there. Something I didn't know until I read his bio this afternoon. He then served as a New York Times reporter for a while, and then began teaching at Princeton, where he taught history for 40 years before coming here and taking over the Harvard University library system, and continuing to write wonderful books about history, especially French cultural history. I'll say just a bit more about Bob in a minute after I introduce our second speaker, who is John Palfrey. Uh, John attended Harvard College, then got his MPhil not at Oxford, but at Cambridge in history, then came to Harvard Law School, graduated in 2001, served in the salt mines of a law firm for a year, and then saw the light and came to the Berkman Center, where he was uh, a brilliant executive director between 2002 and 2008. Um, he joined the Berkman Center at the same time I became faculty director of the center, and uh, without him it would have been impossible for me to keep the organization going. So John built up to Berkman Center to more or less its current condition, and then moved on specifically to the Harvard Law School Library, which, of which he was the director for four years. And at the same time, continued to serve as a tenured member of the faculty teaching here at the law school many courses related to information technology. One of John's many contributions here at Harvard Law School was to transform the institution from an almost entirely paper-based traditional institution to one that relied significantly more heavily, but certainly not exclusively, upon access to online materials. Not an easy process, as usual, very well executed. Then last year, he stepped up yet one more time and is now the head of school at Andover, um, where he retains, among other things, his passion for information technology and education. So here's the thing that links the two of them. Both Bob and John have been involved from the beginning in the creation of the Digital Public Library of America, an institution that aspires at least eventually, to make available to the world for free all of the world's information resources. There will be many steps toward that goal, but that's the grand ambition. And uh, those topics will, I'm sure, come up in our discussion tonight. 
So we were supposed to be joined by a third speaker, Brewster Kale, who runs the Internet Archive, created the Internet Archive, but at the last minute he couldn't attend. So the part of Brewster Kale will be played tonight by me. <laughs> I will be speaking about, well, whatever issues are left over after these two brilliant spokesmen at the outset say their pieces. Um, but I hope, among other things, to speak at least briefly about my own suggestions for how the Digital Public Library of America might be organized in a fashion that advanced its ultimate goal, but also respected the critically important need for authors, defined expansively, to be appropriately compensated for their creations. So that's the plan for the evening. We will, as usual, confine, I'm not sure this is as usual, but we will try to confine our remarks to a total of 45 minutes, leaving 45 minutes for discussion. As usual, the folks in the room are encouraged will, to uh, submit questions through various devices, and their questions will be depicted on the left-hand screen. Folks in the online environment will be submitting questions to their teaching fellows, who will be curating them, and they will appear on the right-hand screen. So that's the plan. Mr. Dart. Uh, thank you, Terry. May I say, Terry, you is may. this an informal setting? I gather it is, and so I would like to offer some very informal remarks to leave plenty of time for debate, because there's a lot to debate about. John and I are enthusiasts for the Digital Public Library of America. We love books. We love libraries. I think there are lots of book lovers and librarians out there watching. So we're all in this together. But there's a danger of oversimplifying things and making everything sound, well, too easy and even too positive. So what I'd like to do would be to begin by taking a very broad look at the history of libraries, the history of copyrights, and to see how that positions us as we try to create this library of libraries, mother of all libraries, the modern library of Alexandria, the digital public library. And you've probably noticed that I'm abusing rhetoric. There's a danger of making it sound too grand. And in fact, we are starting at a modest level, and we expect to build it up and up and up until someday it will really will convey the great riches of the cultural heritage, not just of this country, but of the world to the world. So let me begin by taking a very quick look at the history of libraries. The point I want to make is that it's easy to be triumphalist about it to imagine this history as a great trajectory, spreading knowledge throughout the world. In fact, the history of libraries is very uneven, and it's got a dark side. Even the Library of Alexandria, we don't know much about it, but we do know that it was not a great public library where people poured in. In fact, uh, although it did house a few scholars, it was not a place to make scrolls available to readers. It was really a monument to the glory of the Ptolemaic dynasty, which wanted to keep this library to itself. And you can find lots of other examples in the history of libraries. Uh, the Ming dynasty, for example, in the 18th century, uh, they set out to build a kind of Chinese library of Alexandria, not that that was their model, but you know the greatest library ever. And they began by confiscating books from other libraries and destroying all the books that did not favor the Ming dynasty. And of course, kept it to the dynasty itself, didn't let readers in. So we shouldn't think of libraries as wonderful, open, democratic spaces. In fact, where John and I did graduate work, in my case in Oxford, libraries were behind walls and the walls had spikes on them to keep you out. My college closed at 10 o'clock at night 
a huge gate slammed shut. And if you were outside, you had to climb over these walls and negotiate the spikes. Well, symbolically, it was a way of saying these cultural riches were for the privileged, the few who had been admitted to Oxford. So the history of libraries got better. I'm not trying to make it sound too black. Uh, in 1692, if you were French, you could be admitted to the Royal Library in, uh, of the King. The British Museum opened in 1757 to a few readers. Uh, the great turning point in this country is 1848 with the opening of the Boston Public Library. As it said in the famous inscription over the main entrance, free to all. So you got the beginning of libraries being open and a process of democrat democratization setting in uh, really quite late from the during the second half of the 19th century. Now, if you look at the history of copyright, that too, if you take a very long view of it, isn't really about the sheer protection of what we call today intellectual property. There's much more to it than that. In fact, the word intellectual property is a fairly recent word. Some people say it was first used around 1945. We use it every day, but it's, it's a neologism. The words used uh, throughout most of the past had to do with monopoly and exclusive privilege. So what uh, was used to protect the rights of not so much authors as booksellers were legal combinations to give them a monopoly over the book trade. And if you read the works of Milton or Locke, you find a constant damnation of monopoly and scorn for the company of stationers, which had this monopolistic power over books. The word copyright was not even used in the first Copyright Act of 1710. Uh, it has a glorious title, an act for the uh, encouragement of learning. That's terrific, but the word copyright slowly crept into the English language in the 1730s. Elsewhere in Europe, the key word was, well, sometimes monopoly or exclusive right, but mainly privilege in French, in German, in Italian, they all use variations of this word whose Latin word root means private law. So we should imagine a world in which the norm is private law, that is to say law that ap applies only to certain individuals or groups and gives them an exclusive use of some uh, commodity or some uh, activity. In the case of uh, all of continental Europe, you've got monopolies of booksellers' guilds. They controlled all of the rights to the books, and these rights are enforced by the state. So that's the kind of background to copyright. And when it begins to be developed in England, what you see again, I think, are not just abstract principles about ownership of what we today call intellectual property, you see a commercial fight going on among vested interests and lobbies. The biggest lobby being those who controlled and monopolized the book trade in England, the company of stationers. So um, what happened in the first Copyright Act of 1710 was a kind of revolt among the political classes in the wake of the Great Revolution of 1688 to restrict that monopoly. And the company of stationers, the booksellers, fought it with everything they had. They were hoping to get to reinforce their rights. And instead, they got, well, an exclusive right for 14 years renewable once. Quite different from what we think of today. How do they continue to fight it? Well, first of all, they flex their muscles and they try to keep interlopers out of the trade. But secondly, they took things to court. And you have a whole series of court actions running through the 18th century in which the defendants of authors often, but especially booksellers, the monopolists of the uh, company of stationers, 
argue for perpetual copyright. They say, well, the author invested his talent, his spirit, his intelligence into this work, and it belongs to him, just as land belongs to someone who cultivates land, a Lockean argument, and therefore it should be unlimited. Well, when Locke himself uh, be, looked at this, and you can see it in his correspondence, he just saw, again, the danger of monopoly. So Locke, the apostle of natural rights, isn't actually lining up behind the booksellers at all, just as Milton did not. And the cases went through the courts until the climactic case, which you probably have studied in this course, Donaldson versus Beckett. I'm surely, no? Okay, 1774. <laughs> Uh, there's a spectacular case, I won't go into the details, but essentially uh, the House of Lords, the supreme legal authority, said copyright is not perpetual. And it became, in practice, limited to 14 years renewable once. That's what we inherited in this country in our first, well, in the Constitution, Clause 1, Section 1, Clause uh, uh, Article 1, uh, section 1, Clause 8, sorry, I'm getting my clauses mixed up, uh, which you've studied, no doubt, in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. Uh, it, um, it talked about the importance of balancing two factors, the um, advancement of knowledge on the one hand and the right of authors to the exclusive uh, use of their property in uh, their products, their intellectual products, for a limited time. And that time, as you know, was limited in the first Copyright Act of 1790 to 14 years renewable once. So we had a pattern at the founding of the Republic of uh, resistance to commercialization. And now I'm going to generalize abusively, but I think you can look back over this whole period and see two opposing forces, commercialization and democratization. Uh, now, I think those forces are still opposed, and this is a wonderful, fascinating moment in which we can try to tip the balance to the, in the direction that the founding fathers, people like Jefferson and even Madison, certainly Franklin, favored. That is to say, the public good. And we're doing this through the founding of the Digital Public Library of America, the DPLA. What I think the DPLA can do is to realize what was only a kind of utopian dream on the part of the founders of the American Republic, namely to make knowledge accessible to everyone. They thought that a republic could not flourish unless everyone had access to knowledge. And therefore, they were very keen on the printing press, journals, and that sort of thing. The difficulty was uh, that, first of all, the literacy rate, it was pretty good in New England, but elsewhere very low, and throughout the world, quite bad. And people, if they could read, didn't have enough money to buy books or newspapers. So this was a world that was still living in the technology developed by Gutenberg and that had really not changed much since Gutenberg's time. But today, the technological context is totally different. And so thanks to the internet and modern technology, we can realize what was only an ideal in the minds of people like Jefferson and Franklin. How are we going to do it? Well, probably John will go into this in more detail, uh, but essentially we are creating a distributed system in which the digitized resources of research libraries will be made available through a wonderful infrastructure which is now up and working to everyone. Everyone who has access to the internet will be able to get to these documents, images, recordings, videos, as this library grows and grows from the core which went online last Thursday. Now, where does copyright come into this? John, I don't want to uh, 
take your argument, and you can develop it much better than I can. But briefly, in creating the DPLA, we face a whole series of problems. Problems of organization, of determining what the public is, of uh, knowing what sort of content can be included, uh, problems of technology, and so on. And actually, we think we've solved them. Thanks to the Berkman Center and lots of other Americans who voluntarily have contributed their expertise and labor, we have enough money, we've got the technology, we've got the will to make it happen. Our single largest problem, in my view, is copyright. Now, no one intends for a moment to infringe copyright. But, as you know, the copyright laws today are very different from what they were with the first Copyright Act of 1790. You might even say it's all been downhill since then, something we could debate. In any case, today, after the Copyright Act of 1988, uh, copyright exists for the life of the author plus 70 years. In the case of corporative creation, 95 years. Most books, in other words, and other forms of creation are covered by copyright for more than a century. And that means the DPLA cannot make available the bulk of the literature from the 20th century. Most books, all books after uh, 1964, most books after 1923, some books, believe it or not, according to specialists in copyright, they go back to 1873. So what kind of a digital public library can we have if we can't make all of this material available? How are we going to solve the problem? Well, John has lots of ideas on this. Let me just talk, suggest one or two. One is uh, it should be possible to take use of the fair use doctrine in the Copyright Act of 1976. Uh, section 107 and Section 109 that has to do with the first sale doctrine. I don't know how much you've covered this in this course, but they open up possibilities of making works available to users under certain conditions. Another possibility, for sure, is making books available to the visually impaired. Uh, we can get into lots of details about so-called transformative uses of works. Uh, and then finally, we will create something called the Authors Alliance, an appeal to authors to voluntarily transfer their rights, the use of their rights rather, to the Digital Public Library of America. So that's the general strategy we have worked out. And perhaps I should turn things over to John Palfrey, who can elaborate on that. John? This is so fun to be here. Thank you for the chance. And before I start, and I will pick up where uh, Bob left off, I just want to say thank you to Terry, who's um, uh, my mentor in life and in all things uh, intellectual and in the spirit of intellectual property. I'm always thinking about how we stand on the shoulders of giants, and Terry has the broadest shoulders I know of. Um, and more recently in the world of libraries, it's a huge honor to be beside my mentor in the world of libraries and Bob Dern. So thank you for the chance to be here. Um, and it's so fun to be a part of this particular class. I um, left Harvard Law School a year or so ago, and I miss it very much. So I'm delighted that I'm still invited back from time to time. And uh, in particularly to have the chance to be in this class that is a blended learning experience. I, one of the things I worked on before I left was I was honored to be on the team of people who presented to the, to the deans of Harvard the proposal to do edX in this way. And um, one of the things I made the case for was, in fact, the kind of class you're doing here, one that combines a class that's a degree granting course at Harvard Law School and has people joined in physical space with those who are watching this from afar and to have teaching fellows and others coordinating this in Jamaica and other wonderful places around the world. So it's a real honor to be here and thank you. I'm sorry to do a preamble, but I felt it necessary and thank you. Um, I want to pick up roughly where Bob left off and I will hit some of the copyright strategies, but to take a half a step back and to say I think that the problem that the Digital Public Library of America initiative is solving is one that's slightly broader, broader than copyright, but which ends up coming back to copyright. So just one step, half step back. 
think one of the things that those of us who have studied the information and technology space in the last few decades have worried about is the notion of an enclosure movement, the idea that in cyberspace, we have these extraordinary opportunities to make information radically available for democratic ends of various sorts, some of which I'm sure you've talked about in the context of copyright theory. And yet, in the way in which the space is developing, we see many of the public environments being held in private hands. And a worry about that. And I worry about that particularly when it comes to libraries in the following way which is if you think for a moment about where information that's newly created, digital information, whether it's a newspaper or a book or a video like this one, they're created in a digital format. They are often rendered in physical format, right? They're often rendered in the form of the great old codex, the kind of printed book. But increasingly, people want them in digital form. And if you think about what libraries have done historically, if what they do is to bring a bunch of physical materials to a specific zip code, including this one, 02138, and store them someplace and expect people to come to them, that's not a particularly good strategy going forward, right? If increasingly we can see from user behavior that people want to access materials that are in digital format, that are interactive, that are um, immediately accessible, and some of which, most of which, increasingly are stored in the cloud, you then think about who owns the cloud, right? The cloud itself is owned by Amazon and other corporations. And that's not libraries um, as a space. And then you think about what are the materials that people often want from libraries. Um, set aside the infrastructure of the cloud. Think about the particular materials. And if you ask leading publishers, if you think about the really five or six big publishers, commercial publishers, um, the bulk of them, really save one, won't in fact lend a digital copy to or a sell license to a library a digital copy of their book in order to be able to lend it. Random House is one example where they have allowed this. And Random House allows it on a very simple basis, which is they will sell you a copy of Professor Darton's latest book, The Case for Books. Is that your latest or two ago? Two ago, excuse me, I'm sorry, two ago, the case for books. Um, you can purchase it as an ordinary book and then you can lend it on the same basis of having a physical book, um, but just in the old school way, in the, in the sense that if some, one person has it, then one other person can't have it. That seems perfectly reasonable to me, but most other publishers won't allow that. And I see a friend and a former publisher. There are wonderful publishers um, as uh, um, represented in the room that have uh, experimented with things, but by and large, publishers will not allow libraries to do what they've been set up to do, which is to acquire materials, bless you, and then lend them free to all to individuals. This is not a good arrangement for libraries. If increasingly the infrastructure is owned by private actors, and the private actors that own the materials that people want to access won't even allow them to be lent on the ordinary basis in five out of six major cases right, of the big publishers, I think libraries are in a real a huge amount of trouble looking forward. I don't think the trajectory is good for libraries absent some kind of a shift. And what I think of the Digital Public Library of America as is, in a way, an attempt to bend the arc of this trajectory, to say, can we intervene in some fashion that will allow for this public interested approach to come forward to say, we in fact could define what we think a library ought to be in this digital space, um, including physical spaces, which we badly need, including wonderful re reference librarians and others. I see a few of them in the room, my friend June, bless you. Um, they're extraordinary people. Um, and I think in fact, librarians as individuals are more important than they've ever been in the history of mankind. I think the information space is more complicated. We need more guides, not fewer but we need them doing different things. And if in fact we in the library business or we as library lovers don't get in front of the current trajectory, I think libraries are basically gonna go out of business. I think we're gonna be in a space where we will not have the kind of institution like the Boston Public Library with free to all emblazoned on the front uh, entrance way in a digital era. We have to do something that intervenes. So the Digital Public Library is that intervention. It's meant to say, let's all come together. Let's bring capital in the form of private foundations bringing money. Let's bring big institutions and our stuff, the things that we've digitized. Um, and let's make it on a, on a wonderful, beautiful platform that anybody can take open metadata, open content, open 
uh, access to as many of the materials as we can afford and allow libraries to present that to people in a way that is consistent with library principles and consistent with privacy and other interests. So that's the idea. Can we, through collective action, bend this particular arc in a positive way favoring the public interest? And you may have talked about the Google Books settlement and process some in this course. Um, and some people have said, is the DPLA a response to the Google Books settlement? And to some extent, I think the answer is yes. I think in some ways, the people who came together to build the DPLA are people who have said, we can do better than what Google tried to do. Google had to come to us as libraries to get our stuff, to digitize it, right? And what did Google bring, actually? They brought a couple hundred million dollars, some really good technology, and mostly a bunch of chutzpah, right, that we just didn't have back then. I think we now have that chutzpah. We are getting an increasing amount of capital, and we've got some good technology, and I think we can do something that is in the public interest and better. Okay, so that's the basic aspiration. It launched last Thursday. It is at dp.la, and those of you, many of you have laptops in the room, and instead of doing your email or being on ESPM, I urge you to go to dp.la and enjoy the very first um, instance of the DPLA. So, as Professor Darton said, there are major obstacles in the way of going from what we have now, this open platform, which I think is very effective and is attractive and useful, to something that is, in fact, universal or at least broad enough to meet most people's needs. I think if you do a sample search on something, if it happens to meet the kinds of things we have in there, you can find some cool stuff. But right now, it's not, it's not enough. It's just a, a glimmer of what it could be as an open platform. And I think the major problem that we have at the moment is, can we attract enough material in form of books, in the form of images, in the form of sound files and videos and so forth to make this a really useful thing that in fact can help to uh, promote libraries and the, uh, the access to information, those democratizing things that we seek to accomplish. And the primary problem in our way is one of copyright. Turns out it's not getting people to participate. So one of the cool things about the DPLA today is that we have a public-private partnership in the sense that we actually have the National Archives has given us 1.2 million digital materials to put in this, including the original Declaration of Independence and all that great stuff. We've gotten the Smithsonian, this great national institution. We've gotten Harvard's libraries. We've gotten New York Public. We've gotten the uh, University of Virginia. Lots of people are putting in materials. Brewster, Kayla Internet Archive, um, if you're watching out there, Brewster, bless you for helping. Um, we've gotten lots of materials in there, but we cannot put things in yet. Or we haven't put things in yet that are in copyright. So the strategy that we've adopted is to start in the zones that we know we can uh, do properly and do in a way that's respecting copyright. And we've thought about this from the start as a series of materials that are in the green zone, some things in the yellow zone, and some things in the red zone. So just being very sim in simple terms, things in the green zone are things in the public domain. And we know that we can include those materials in the Digital Public Library of America. They are defined as Bob uh, described them. There might be other ways to define what's in the public domain, but we know we can use them. We fear, though, that if we limit ourselves to the green zone, we will have the Digital Public Library of Jane Austen. Right? We will have a digital public library that's very old um, in terms of its materials and be very useful in some respects to historians, but it may not be what we aspire for it to be or will not be what we aspire for it to be uh, in broader sense. So what's in the yellow zone? In the yellow zone, I would describe things in particular, just as an example, um, that are orphan works. I suspect you've talked about orphan works in this class, but materials where we do not know who the copyright holder is or there's a reasonable um, dispute about it, and where if we were to include them in the Digital Public Library of America, um, we might be able to make a case for why this ought to be included, but we would have some risk. We'd be running some risk, at least under current US law. And then in the red zone are materials that are currently in copyright, where there's no argument that we could make that says there's a reason to include this in its uh, uh, immediate format. Um, and uh, we could think about things that are first, those that are in copyright but out of print, and then last, things that are in print and in copyright. So that's in the red zone. So the approach initially has been to include things only in green and then move over time to yellow and to red. And we would love your help in this discussion to figure out how we should approach the yellow and the red. There are a bunch of strategies that we have put on the table. And the DPLA has been unusual in a planning initiative because we have done all this planning in the open. We have, perhaps as a risk, a legal risk, we've had a conversation with anybody who wishes to have this conversation with us about what we should do and how we might do it. So there are a bunch of different strategies that we, we could, uh, we could uh, pursue. 
The first strategy for materials in yellow and in red is to use the existing law. And Bob adverted to this a moment ago. So use the existing law to lend materials directly on a theory that Brewster Kale, were he here, he would advance, I think, quite forcefully. Brewster has convinced a number of libraries, including state libraries, interestingly, to contribute materials to a resource that then lends them on a one-off basis, much in the random house way, to individuals, making the argument that under current law, he has the right to do that. This is disputed by some, but it's also something that he is actively doing right now. And he would be forcefully advocating for this. And he forcefully advocates for the, for the DPLA to take this particular approach. Another approach using existing law is the question of, in fact, licensing materials directly. Right? We could, under current um, law, go to a publisher and get a license from them that allows us to on certain terms, to lend materials uh, directly through the DPLA, right? There are lots of things that we could do in that, in that zone. Second uh, argument is that we could create some uh, attractive new licensing regimes that might be a little bit innovative. So an example that Bob uh, described is the Authors Alliance, a notion that people might come together as authors and somehow contribute to a DPLA or otherwise a set of rights that they have in their works. And if you think about academic um, uh, authors, we do not write things for the royalty checks we get. They are too small. Um, if, in fact, you're writing articles, they are non-existent. If you're writing books, for most of us, they are maybe enough for Bob to go on vacation or for Terry. I can't go on vacation on royalty checks, to be sure. Um, they are, we are not writing things for the purpose of selling them. Some publishers are. But it's plausible that we could arrange a scheme, either over a period of time um, or immediately, where people will uh, contribute their works into the uh, DPLA. You might think about the open access movement as sort of analogous to this. A variant of this, though, um, is an idea that I think um, some people in the room may have worked on, which is the idea of taking the Creative Commons notion and creating a related license called a library license that might be a specific licensing term that an author and a publisher might agree to in the first instance and use that as a way to document a commitment after some period of time to put a book or other creative materials into the DPLA. So the idea might work like this. Professor Nesson in the back row writes a new book on evidence as he's written in the past. And he goes to his publisher and says, I've got this wonderful book, and I don't care all that much about the royalties. And what I would like you to do is to uh, publish it on the basis of one of these library licenses. So you can exploit for, say, four months, which is what most publishers say they need in terms of recouping um, the amount that they invest in the work. Or there might be four years. You could determine some period of time. Um, where it's directly sold to the public. And after that point, rights would revert to a DPLA to be able to offer it on a free-to-all basis. So you can imagine lots of hybrids here where authors and publishers might come up with a scheme that meets the balance of the Copyright Act in the sense of allowing people to be compensated for their work, including publishers and um, editors and agents and others who put together um, these wonderful works, and then to have things revert to this uh, broader public. That's a plausible strategy and one in the works. So those would be potential licensing regimes. And then the third, which I hope that Professor Fisher may talk some about, is to do something more radical. Something more radical, which might take the form of an entire alternative compensation system. If you have read this chapter six of Promises to Keek, has that been um, assigned in this class? So in Professor Fisher's book from uh, 2004, Stanford University Press, is that so? Um, the final chapter makes the argument in the music context and the movie context that we could establish either a voluntary or a state-sanctioned a regime for alternative compensation, uh, alternative compensation system that allows for authors and uh, publishers, the copyright holder, to be compensated on a pro rata basis, on, um, depending on how many times the work has been used. We could imagine an analogy direct for um, books and for libraries that would build upon that same theory. It would build upon the thoughtful work around privacy. How might you think about not um, having that be a privacy detracting scheme? So you could imagine a world in which the DPLA establishes with a series of partners who might be these publishers an alternative compensation regime that allows for anybody anywhere to enjoy a book or a sound file or a movie file in the original conception and on a pro rata basis for money that has been 
um, uh, put into a common pot to be paid back out to the authors and to the other copyright holders. How might this work? Well, a really simple thing is we spend billions of dollars a year in the United States on libraries, right? If we thought differently about the collection budgets of libraries and pooled some of it, I don't think that we would have a lot of trouble coming up with that amount of money to make an alternative compensation system work. Now, I mentioned this third and most radical uh, proposal in opposition, in a way, to the first idea of using existing law. Were Brewster here, Brewster Kill, he would say, we do not want to go down this third road. It would be a bad idea for us to do it because we have plenty of rights. We have plenty of rights under the current Copyright Act, and in fact, we should be exploiting those to the fullest in the spirit that many people who argue in favor of a strong fair use doctrine suggest that we ought to be consistently pushing um, on that boundary in order to strengthen the fair use right itself. So uh, there is, within the DPLA community, a dispute between whether or not we should pursue this alternative ordering um, mechanism or we should simply be pushing on the existing set of rights. So that's the state of play on DPLA. And love to talk about, but I also would love all of your help in solving this problem and building a digital public library that is worthy of the name. Thank you. Those were two wonderful and complimentary presentations. And um, they change what I was going to talk about, uh, in part because, um, Bob, you have so nicely um, tied our current situation to the history of the copyright system and the somewhat discouraging influence over time of commercial interests, and highlighted the extent to which the copyright regime, as is currently constituted, erects barriers to what we collectively are trying to achieve. And uh, John, among other things, you have more effectively channeled Brewster than I could have done. So uh, his position on these issues, I think, has been nicely summarized. He is online, by the way. Oh, yeah, um, it's probably some sort of some frustration that he's not speaking. But um, I think you quite nicely summarize his position briefly to connect it with one of the themes that we've discussed in this course. Brewster's the set of arguments upon which Brewster relies is very similar to the set of arguments on which Redigi relied ultimately unsuccessfully, or at least in an intermediate moment, unsuccessfully. Brewster's view is that it should be lawful to replicate in the digital environment the kinds of privileges that Section 109A protects in the traditional real space environment. And so in particular, if a library, namely his own, contrived to use digital technologies to ensure that only one borrower at a time had access to a digital version of a book that, once scanned, is kept out of circulation, that should be lawful. And as a functional matter, there's a great deal of strength to that argument. It unfortunately doesn't align well with the current statute. And at least if the Redigi opinion holds up, it's in trouble. Now, hasten to add, there's one respect in which Brewster is in a better position than Redigi, which is Brewster is um, a philanthropist. Uh, he deserves enormous credit and applause for his willingness to construct this um, astoundingly socially beneficial system for no personal gain. And by contrast, Redigi is a for-profit enterprise seeking to exploit the temporary market for um, digital copies of sound recordings, most importantly. So that Redigi has thus far come to grief does not necessarily mean that Brewster is similarly threatened, but it does imperil his position somewhat. 
Okay, so ha having made those, amplified those connections, which you two have so already so effectively created, I want to um, address the concerns expressed by authors about this trend. So I'll take as an example Scott Turow's piece in the New York Times about two weeks ago, lamenting the decision in Aereo, which you know about. His position is that um, too many people and too many ingenious lawyers are seeking ways to creatively adapt new technologies to A, facilitate more widespread distribution of works, and B, make money without attending to the needs of authors. This would be annoying, but no more, if authors continue to enjoy the same revenue streams they always had. But they aren't. Their traditional revenue streams are dying as people buy fewer and fewer books, rely more and more on e-books, which for contractual reasons, itself a complicated question, provide them less steady sources of revenue than the old form. Scott Turow points out, accurately I think, that best-selling authors like himself are not especially endangered, besides he's a partner in a law firm. But many other authors are in increasing trouble. So as we pursue this vision, the vision that you so nicely identified and that, as you know, I share, finding mechanisms that would uh, enable us to advance the interests of authors seem important. So I'm going to offer a slightly different version, with Ed's help here, of this plan. If you can put my own slides up. Yeah, great. OK. Um, so some of this will be just going over the same ground that we've talked about, that both Bob and John have talked about. So here with a little slightly different emphasis. If you imagine the DPLA as an organization. Now this is a little tricky because, as Bob emphasized in his presentation, the DPLA is very unlikely to be a structure analogous to the Boston Public Library and the New York Public Library. It's a distributed system with uh, holdings scattered for security reasons and convenience many different places, perhaps in local libraries. That's an issue perhaps we can come back to later. Are we killing off local libraries? With it? Exactly. Okay. So it's a distributed system, but you can think of it conceptually as an organization, and as an organization, it needs money. So those might come from fees, and they might come from funding. OK, hold that in abeyance for a moment. Let's think about where those sources of money might come from later. For the time being, let's think about what it should do. So it should provide, if it's true to its name as public library, a set of services to the public for free, as libraries have traditionally done. Critical to keep a hold of this commitment, this is what Google did not do. Google aspired to this, originally to this, but through negotiations with the copyright owners, it retreated step by step by step. In the end, far enough that Harvard University refused to pursue its arrangement with Google because the deal that emerged from the multi-year struggle had insufficient attention to the interests of the public. All right, so what services should the DPLA commit itself permanently to offer for free, not just to Americans, despite its Library of America label, but to the world? Well, one, all of the materials in its collection should be available to be read or viewed or listened to, depending on the character of the medium, by anyone for free. Second, reproduction for non-commercial purposes should also be free because it facilitates, at least temporarily, until the cloud takes over activities of A here. Next, non-consumptive uses. This is actually one of the most important potential advances of a library least attended to. Is once stuff is available in a digital format, ways of processing it, learning from a, in an aggregated way, for research purposes are enormous. And we should be careful to ensure that researchers have access to those uses. And last but not least, privileged uses, for example, transformative fair uses. 
And you might say, well, you don't have to commit yourself to that. That's, of course, lawful. But it turns out, as some of you know, that contractually, currently, there are organizations that are chipping away at transformative fair uses. For example, UMG's deal with YouTube. OK, so commit to free access to these functions. Everything in the DPLA has to be made available to the world on this basis. But that doesn't mean that everything has to be available in, for all uses for free. You can imagine other activities that the DPLA would facilitate for which people would pay. And they could include reproduction for commercial purposes. And here's where my suggestion is going to dovetail with what John ended on, namely, it would be most efficient and mutually beneficial for consumers on the yellow side and producers, who are going to appear in just a minute, on the other side, if this is done on a flat basis, sometimes known as extended compulsory licensing, a uh, posted fee basis, not a individualized negotiation basis. OK, those we describe as type 2 uses. These are illustrative, not exhaustive. And these, as I say, could generate some money paid either to the DPLA directly or more likely through an organization that already handles transactions of this sort, which is the Copyright Clearance Center, which has volunteered to undertake this job. And some of the money generated through this mechanism could come back to the DPLA. Not all of it, but some. OK, third. Here we come closest to addressing Scott Turow's concerns. The DPLA could facilitate type 3 uses. Type 3 uses are for-profit activities that traditionally we've expected users to get permission for and to pay freely negotiated fees and should continue to do so in this online environment. Would include, for example, for-profit public performances of dramatic works or musical works or whatever. It would also include things like motion picture adaptations of novels or a variety of commercial derivative works. So again, money generated by these would be passed through an organization like the, DP, like the Copyright Clearance Center, but the streams of money here would be larger. OK, now where's the stuff housed in that middle box come from? Um, I wish I remembered the color scheme, the green, yellow, red, but I didn't. So these are blue, sadly. Um, so the first hunk of materials is the um, you know, middle marches of the world, um, older stuff, or somewhat more optimistically, things that have been dedicated to the, cre to the public domain through CC0 licenses and so forth. So, OK, that's easy to conceptualize. And these things would all be available for all three types of uses for free because they're not protected by copyright law. OK. Conceptually, also relatively simple, are proprietary materials. And here are Scott Turow's stuff. I think it's important that the system be designed so as to encourage the deposit of these materials. And here's how I hope one could assemble an attractive package. You say to Mr. Turow or similarly situated movie producers, if you make your stuff available to DPLA, you have to allow type 1 uses for free. But that's OK. These often developers of materials will be willing to license that. But we will, in turn, facilitate for you type 2 uses and type 3 uses, and we will compensate you accordingly through either flat fees or license fees. The hardest box, this is what in John's scheme, the yellow zone, are orphan works. These are works that might be in copyright. We don't know because they don't know what, we don't know whether they were properly renewed. Might still be in copyright. And the owners thereof, if they existed at all, might be interested in remuneration. But we can't ascertain who they are, at least without exorbitant costs. The set of works that fit this category is very large. So Bob, in the Harvard University Library, 
what percentage fit in this box? I, <clears throat> Alas, I don't know. Estimates are that there could be as many as 2 million books in that can be considered orphans. Great. So how do we get this such things into the system? So here I would suggest slightly different approach, actually a supplement to the array of possibilities that have already been suggested. Here I build on the work of uh, Pam Samuelson and Molly von Howling, who've talked about this issue. Section 108 of the Copyright Act is actually not very good for these purposes. Tiny exception for non-permissive reproduction and distribution by libraries. But 107 is potentially more useful than it first appears. Specifically, if the way in which the DPLA managed those orphan works were sufficiently attentive to the needs of their conceivable authors and protective of their long-run financial interests, it might well pass muster under Section 107. So what would that mean? Well, it would mean first, automated searches of the set of works that you might incorporate on this basis to ensure that you've done as much as possible to ascertain their copyright owners. Second, require users of those works to provide information so that the users can be tracked if the owners of the copyrights ever show up. And last but not least, here building on Molly von Howling, ensure that the digital versions of these works have metadata in them so that their subsequent uses can be tracked and accounted for if, again, the owners ever make an appearance. So precautions of that sort would minimize the likelihood that you have casually grabbed stuff that's commercially valuable and owned by somebody, and maximize the chance that if someone eventually makes an appearance and says, actually, that's mine, they get paid. In the aggregate, such an approach would be beneficial to the copyright owners at issue. So the basic idea here is more important than the details. The basic idea here is we should aspire in when constructing this institution, on the one hand, to preserve the principle of public library, but on the other hand, facilitate the emergence of an ecology that, over the long haul, not only respects, but enhances the financial position of authors who still wish to depend upon traditional forms of compensation. OK, so we've exhausted our time. Um, I hope there are now some questions about these alternative approaches. So we're going to put up the two question boards. And try to respond here. So um, if questions come from the Harvard Law School audience, um, it would be great if the person who's asked the question would raise his or her hand. Um, let's try this. Do you believe the DPLA would speed up the erosion of the printed book industry? And if so, to what extent do you believe that something would be lost? Mr. Darton. <laughs> well, the DPLA has existed for almost one week. So I don't think we can measure its effect on the printed industry. Let me add one thing where I slightly differ from you, Terry. You were saying that authors are getting less and less from printed books. I don't think that's true. The production of printed books gets greater every year, along with the output of electronic books and all kinds of advances into the digital age. The last increase was 6% over the previous year, measuring uh, the year 2012 versus 2011. The idea that the printed book is finished in some respect is, I think, false. And the misunderstanding goes deep into the history of communication. It seems to assume that one medium of communication can displace another. But we've learned through this 
kind of history that it's simply not true. In fact, this is one of the most astounding things in the study of the early period. Manuscript publishing, publishing books by hiring copyists to copy out editions, increased after Gutenberg, continued to flourish for the next two centuries and even a third century later. Now, it's true it eventually disappeared, but my point is that the printed book has enormous resilience. The codex was one of the greatest inventions of all time. We don't know when it happened, around the time of the birth of Christ. And the printed codex is doing very nicely, thank you. So I believe that uh, far from existing on opposite extremes of a technological spectrum, the printed and the digital, that they actually are complementary. And that what we need to work out through the digital public library and other means is to make the most of this complementarity. So in short, no, the DPLA is not a threat to the printed book. And we want to help the printed book, as well as the digital book, continue to flourish. Who asked the question? Rebecca, you want to follow up? My, my concern was mostly that I, I The reason I asked is because I noticed that a lot of professors today, or when I was in college at least, they, they required that we actually find a book from the actual library instead of using online resources because at least research papers today, a lot of people use like one quote they find from Google Books or like online articles and that libraries themselves, like the actual institutions, aren't doing as well. So that's why I was concerned that the archiving of codexes, I guess, is going to decline if everything's available online. Uh, well, I share the concern. I'm teaching a seminar right now, and most of my students uh, read the assigned works online, on screens. I'm also, uh, as a historian of books, dedicated to the importance of studying the book as a physical object. You can learn so much from it by feeling the paper, by smelling it, by looking at the bindings, studying the marginalia, comparing one edition with another. That's very important. As far as the DPLA is concerned, however, it's not intended just for other college professors and sophisticates like you. It's intended for a very broad and varied audience, including kids in high schools, students in community colleges. We have about 14 million students in community colleges, as many in four-year colleges. Those community colleges don't have good libraries. What about aged people in retirement homes, and people scattered everywhere who need information. These, this is the very broad public we hope to service. So we're not declaring war on the printed book. On the contrary, we want to use it to extend access to it and to the digitized versions of it. Here's a tiny anecdote that's largely, though not quite completely consistent with your remarks. I two years ago, I guess, gave a presentation to a group of librarians from English-speaking sub-Saharan Africa. And I was in, it was in Uganda. And I visited some libraries while there. And uh, these are relatively small buildings. Uh, the main library that I visited had an upstairs and a downstairs. And the upstairs was the traditional library, um, modest in size and holdings, but it was a regular library. And no one was there. Downstairs was a cramped, lightless computer center with 25 terminals. Crowded, bustling, activity, life. OK. A wonderful image of the possibilities of enhancing access to information through the digital environment. But nobody's using the printed stuff. Uh, and I could, it, uh, those folks in the room know I'm an offender in this regard. All, all of my course materials are. All of them are now digital in form. Although there's a separate reason for that. It's partly rebellion against the cost of case books, which are outrageous now. Mr. Palfrey. Yes, sir. What do you think of incidents where digital providers like Amazon have pulled back ebooks, like 1984, for example, that were already purchased and read? How does DRM play into this ability of the commercial vendor to intervene between the text and the reader? There are many 
extremely difficult questions posed on both of these boards. This is one that's a wonderful one, but not that difficult in my view. Oh, good. Well, after you answered that one, pick out any of the letters. I wasn't expecting that as a response. Um, I think that the 1984 example with Amazon speaks to the initial point that I made about the future that we want to avoid, which is that it would be, in my view, a perverse outcome if the digital version of libraries was less effective than the physical version of libraries. But if with all of this extraordinary technology and opportunity and the things we've seen explode in the last 15 years or so in terms of democratic access were in fact to be turned on its head and, and made worse. And the example of a Kindle version purchased by someone um, then retracted without warning, completely consistent with terms of service, as the Amazon lawyers no doubt would quickly point out, um, uh, is a perfect example of that. It was almost too perfect. Like you couldn't have written a better one. And I think it's a reason why we need a DPLA. So I think it, the, the question makes the argument on its own. There's a tricky part, though, buried within the question, which is the second part, which is how does one think about technological protection measures, TPMs or DRMs, digital restrictions management, digital rights management, whichever of the acronyms you wish to use. And one of the problems with the approach that Terry has put up on the board, and which I have favored throughout the process of exploring, whether it's extended compulsory licensing schemes or alternative compensation schemes, whatever you want to call it, might cause us to rely upon DRM or TPMs mm. in order to limit access to the works, whether the limitation is based on the number of concurrent users, the necess necessity of tracking who's using it at some point in your orphan work scheme and so forth. So we would be up against one of these third rails of the you know, net freedom types if we were to go down that road. And that's one of the arguments that is strongest on Brewster's side of this, that we should stay away from anything that is DRM-like. One of the people most active on the DPLA discussion listservs is Dr. Richard Stallman, who has been making the case that we should not do anything that would restrict the use of these forms of intellectual property, much less go down the road of non-free and open software. So someone like Dr. Stallman, someone like Brewster would argue that um, we shouldn't explore some of these approaches, I suspect, on the basis of the necessity of using TPMs or DRMs, a possible um, trick. I will grab hold, though, if I might, of the top question over here, which is harder, mm -hmm. um, uh, about distinguishing the DPLA's mission statement from Wikipedia's isn't Wikipedia better situated to accomplish your stated goals? To what extent is there overlap with Wikisource? Is that someone in the room who's willing to self-identify? Yes, also. An excellent question. And I think one of the hardest ones for us to answer is, are you, in fact, doing something that doesn't exist now? So one example is people have said, you don't need to do the DPLA because you have the internet. Why don't people just Google whatever they want and get what they get back? And Google Books will give it to you or not, and so forth. Um, and I think that's a plausible argument. Another one is Wikipedia does a lot of this stuff pretty well. Why not do it? I think the DPLA does something that neither the internet nor, the, nor Wikipedia has done. Could Wikipedia do it? Absolutely. Right? An extension of Wikipedia um, characterized in the same way um, could do it. It's just not their strategy. And in fact, the key funder of Wikipedia at the moment, the foundation that funds it, Sloan Foundation, is the key funder of DPLA. Many of the people working on Wikipedia are actively working on DPLA. So in fact, the um, co-director of our technology work stream, SJ Klein, is a Wikimaniac of local note. I'm somewhat surprised, perhaps, that SJ isn't here. Maybe he is here virtually. Um, so we are very closely in coordination with Wikipedia. I aspire for DPLA to be very much like Wikipedia, if not a sister organization, um, in many, many respects, in part because of the set of ideals that I think we share in common, in part because of the extraordinary reach of Wikipedia. It's an amazing thing. But actually, most notably in the way in which it's governed and the way in which it's managed. So as we look to what the future of DPLA might be five years from now, I hope it looks a lot like Wikipedia. I hope it's funded a lot like Wikipedia, which is to say, I don't know how many of you have written a check or sent a credit card payment to Wikipedia, but if you had it, it's a really good thing. Because DPL, uh, the Wikipedia is right now funded in its core activities by users, 
all of us fund it and do it and create it. It is, to me, like the collective action of the net, creating a resource for ourselves and sustaining it. And they now have hundreds of people who work there, I think 130 people. And when they go to the Sloan Foundation or others, they're going for special projects, not for keeping the lights on or keeping the servers going. And when they need to get a lot of work done, they turn to us, right? We do it. We're Wikimaniacs. As you may know, the Berkman Center several years ago um, applied to have the Wikimania conference, the annual conference here in Boston. We were in like an Olympic bid against Toronto, um, and we won, and we had it here, and a thousand you know, crazy Wikipedia people came on this very campus, and it was unbelievably fun. It was just people geeking out to create articles and talk about it. I aspire to the DPLA to have a Wikimania-like event. Maybe it's the day after Wikimania, where librarians and library students and people who care about libraries and retired librarians um, come forward and just edit lots of metadata. We just geek out about libraries. And actually, I think that model would be extraordinary if we could, in fact, make it happen. I think right now, um, in terms of the Wikipedia model, n equals 1. There's only kind of 1. And so I describe this within DPLA as the n equals 2 strategy. Like, could we have something as wonderful and as sustainable and as broad-based as Wikipedia? We'd be well off. So the answer is absolutely. We're consistent with it. It's just slightly off-center for what Wikipedia is doing. And I think we should do it in, in partnership. So I'm going to pick up one of these threads myself, and then I've got a present for Bob. Um, so the, the lower left corner should be concerned about privacy implications of tracking the uses of materials in the DPLA. I regard this as a hard question. This is from section A5. Who's A5? Uh-huh, Matt. Um, uh, and it is, was flagged by you in your response to what you regarded was a more straightforward question involving um, the lessons to be learned from the Amazon fiasco. Um, the reason why this is hard is not just because some of the uh, business models we've been discussing would require um, some degree of uh, monitoring usage, and therefore the need to cr collect and appropriately allocate money presses toward a privacy endangering innovation. OK, that's a serious worry. But it's also hard because um, of a principle, or at least a principle that I subscribe to. And it seems most participants in this born digital environment still subscribe to, which is the principle of attribution. Principle that as we loosen all of the um, joints of the information space and increase the fluidity of the environment, we should still aspire to um, giving credit while credit is due. And one of the ways of giving credit while credit is due is to acknowledge, or to have someone acknowledge, or some institution acknowledge popularity, attention, and so forth. So as scholars, we're accustomed to the fidelity to attribution being managed through the non-legal norms of plagiarism and the requirements of appropriate footnoting and so forth. But for most of the kinds of works that are now circulated online, that's not the way in which attribution is made. It's attribution is made through eyeballs or ears. It's consumption. And the only way to do that is to have some mechanism for determining who's listening to or watching what. So it's not just money, the desire to direct revenue to creators that presses toward um, systems that threaten privacy. It's also this principle of attribution that I think is worth pursuing, even if money weren't an issue at all. So are there ways to handle this problem? Well, there are ways of mitigating it. Uh, those ways are actually getting easier now, fortunately, as we shift increasingly from copy-based distribution mechanisms to cloud-based distribution mechanisms, because it's easier to track cloud-based distribution, which is you know, one or another form of streaming, without accounting for who is on the other end, then it is to account for usage when it is done primarily through consumption of copies and peer-to-peer uh, -peer sharing of them. The latter is very tricky to monitor or sample without invading privacy. Um, but cloud-based systems, the technological challenges are a little less severe. But that's not to say they're non-existent. They still exist, still a serious problem to protect legitimate sources of privacy in this environment. Here's one more complication in the same domain, not really in the subject of intellectual property any longer, but still worth mentioning. It turns out that, unfortunately, 
privacy is a highly, tastes for privacy are highly malleable tastes. That people surrender them if they don't have them. And uh, it, we may not face a revolt if we construct systems that don't respect privacy. We may have the worst problem of acquiescence, which would be even worse than revolt. Okay, so a problem, ways of mitigating it, not ways of making it going away. Bob, um, Harvard, uh, this may not be up there any longer, but it can, oh yes, now, oh, it has seven votes, so. Yeah, what does it mean that the Digital Public Library of America is driven by a private group, Harvard, and not a public one? Um, and somebody points out DPLA is actually a separate nonprofit, not part of Harvard. That would probably be your first line of response. Okay, yes, but I will take the side of A4 here. Who's A4? Yeah, Allison, okay. Um, and point out that you're both pretty firmly connected to Harvard. I know you run another institution now, but you're still pretty strongly connected to here. The Harvard collection already is seeding the DPLA. It colors the enterprise, even if it's not legally. So you, <clears throat> you think there might be a kind of crimson color that is creeping into the DPLA. That's reflected in the color of the question, even. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I have. Uh, two points to make, and they are contradictory. Mm. <laughs> so the first point is, of course, the DPLA exists as a not-for-profit corporation. It has a board of directors. These board, the, the directors come from lots of diverse constituencies. Um, it so happens that headquarters, which are very minimal, are located in Boston, not Harvard, but uh, that's not very far away. My point really is that since its first conception, when we had a meeting here at Harvard on October 1st, 2010, the DPLA- In the faculty library in the, uh, yes, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Second meeting, right. first one was at Radcliffe. That was the first crimson <laughs> coloration of the DPLA when it was just a gleam in our collective eye. Since then, its development has really extended throughout the country. And the Harvard impetus has uh, withdrawn. So I don't at all think that the DPLA is a Harvard-driven organization. Harvard was the occasion of its embryonic existence. And thanks to the Berkman Center and people here, Harvard got it going. But since then, it really is going on its own, and there's nothing Harvard-specific about it. Having said that, here's the contradictory point. It seems to me that Harvard University has often had a reputation for being a, a pinnacle of privilege, a, a place where the wealthy would go, the well-born, et cetera, and a place that turned its back to the rest of the world. It had the greatest university library in the world serving its own students and faculty. Now that, first of all, that reputation was not warranted. There's a terrific scholarship program and so on, but it existed. What I feel my main principle as university librarian is opening up Harvard's library. And opening things in general. I love the notion of openness, open access, open roads, open treaties, openly arrived at. I mean, openness is a good thing. And we can think of the Harvard Library as something that was built originally in 1638, the core around which the university grew, the collection of books from John Harvard that gave the university its name, but it's really a national institution. It belongs to the president and fellows of Harvard, but it also belongs to the nation in a larger sense. So I feel that Harvard and other great research libraries, and there are many of them, owe something to the general public. And this is an opportunity for such research libraries to share their intellectual wealth. And they can do it through the DPLA. So and to that extent, I hope there's a slight crimson coloration, 
but it's one that is pointing the DPLA towards the democratization of access to knowledge and not this walled-in world that I tried to describe in talking about the spikes on the walls of Oxford. All right, that was incredibly inspiring. OK. Um, <laughs> John, do you want to pick out one of the questions on the left-hand side here? I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, yes, on behalf of your group, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. ownership in Harvard, I hope I'm not speaking um, too broadly for them. And it's wonderful, especially to hear from you, sir. I recall your piece um, looking ahead on the Google Books then settlement and thinking about the ownership on that institution. If you don't feel you've already, A4 would be very interested in um, someone channeling what they think Brewster's response would be to that question about um, Harvard's leading role in the DPA. Well, uh, just quickly, I mean, Brewster is a great leader. I mean, I'm a Brewster enthusiast, um, and Brewster has for a long time been tr trying to persuade Harvard to follow his strategy, which means making one digitized work available to one reader at a time. The problem with that, as I see it, is that the DPLA should make available its holdings, its collections, to a vast population. And it can, can't perform that function if it's simply a one-on-one -on -one transaction, which is the way that sort of argument takes us. Uh, but Brewster's started it. And I think it's a way to enlarge uh, the, 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 the debate about um, fair use. I mean, Brewster has been a real leader in this respect, and he takes chances. Now, the DPLA has got to develop a risk policy, among other things. Uh, but I think that we need to go much further than one book to one reader at one time. Let me try to hit two quickly, one quickly and then one less quickly from the in-class version. So is the job of the DPLA and those who advocate for digitizing all our information to ensure that some tangible product is always available to prevent massive loss of knowledge? I call this the big magnet problem. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing if, in fact, people's fears that if a big magnet passed over the earth and we had everything only in digital format, we would lose all our knowledge? Um, and the answer is, sure, we should worry about that. Um, it's not the problem that the DPLA is seeking to solve, but I think it needs to be done in partnership with other things. There are a series of projects that would point to good strategies for this. Within the world of law, there's something called the Legal Information Preservation Alliance, LIPA. Um, it's also related to the LLMC, um, which is a related organization. And one of the things that they do is that they take physical, printed versions of the law, cut up the books. They literally use a guillotine on the books, um, shrink wrap the actual text of our law and put them below a salt mine, I think in Kansas, if I have it right. Is that right? Thank you, June. Nodding away. I think that's a good thing. I think it's a really good thing as we digitize stuff to take physical versions and stick them under the earth in at least one format. I think that's a useful belt and suspender strategy. I don't really believe in the big magnet, but I'm glad that we have some of these. The thing we shouldn't do is what we do now, which is we all collect the same stuff and stick them 25 miles away in our depository or in our actual libraries, and nobody ever checks them out. So that we all spend money on this stuff redundantly when we, in fact, could be spending money on a much better strategy. So yes, but we should do it much more smartly and much more collaboratively. Um, the harder one that I wanted to hit was the um, now the leading question. How would a robust DPLA not kill off local libraries? This is, I think, a fundamental question of the DPLA, and it's one that we have met since we first came up with this idea. And I believe more deeply than ever in the value of the local library. The person who raises it said that they have um, fond childhood memories. And I share those fond childhood memories. My own children have those fond childhood memories. And I think all children should continue to have those. Um, the DPLA is meant as a supplement or a complement to physical libraries. The idea for the use of the DPLA fundamentally is, in fact, to make possible materials for other libraries to use. So my own view of the DPLA three years from now or five years from now um, is according to a sort of 80-20 principle. 
I have a sense that 20% of the time, people will actually come to dp.la, as I hope many of you now have, to check out what we have there. But 80% of the time, people are actually going to come to a public library or to a university library or to a community college library. And they're going to encounter the DPLA material that has been presented to them by their local librarian, because it will have been locally curated. That the way we've designed the system is actually we've just built a platform. It's a highly open platform with an open API, application programming interface, or series of them, that allow people to take the DPLA stuff and make whatever they want with it. And the interesting thing is that we've had already dozens and dozens of things built on this open API system. And I think these are the interfaces that people will use. And I think that answers the question of how can or will the DPLA address the needs of the differently abled, which is the answer is, let's all do that. You, in fact, can take the DPLA stuff and render it much more effectively on the basis of specific interests that we have. So we should invest in, uh, in doing that. But the point is, as with Wikipedia or other things, it's an open platform that people can take and do things with it to solve particular problems. And we're not going to solve all of them in DPLA headquarters. We're going to just make it available so lots of people can solve those problems. Who asked the question? Uh, oh, on your own behalf or on behalf of your section? On your own behalf? I see. Yes, I see this. OK. So while Nathaniel's delivering the mic for you, Bob, there was a follow-up here for you, which was, can you address the same theme on the basis of your work at the New York Public Library? Yes, I totally agree with John. I often find myself in agreement with John. Um, what we have learned at the New York Public Library, where I'm one of the trustees, is the vital importance of the 87 branch libraries. And just as you found in Africa, we, found, we find in lots of uh, sections of New York where people are piling into the neighborhood library, part of the New York Public Library system, for lots of different reasons. Some of the old reasons, they want videos, they want magazines, they want to borrow books, and so on. But many people are looking for work. And if you want to find work, you actually go to a branch of the New York Public Library because you can't find want ads in newspapers anymore. They have disappeared as part of the digital revolution. They're all online. But many people in New York don't have computers. They don't know how to use the internet if they had computers. So they go to the New York Public Library in their neighborhood uh, they get access to the computer, but they're shown by librarians how to use those computers. And I think this is a tremendous service. The branch libraries are becoming community centers in many different ways. And they are, just exactly as John said, they are the intermediaries that are connecting people with this whole world of knowledge and information. So yes, the... Um, We've learned at the New York Public Library how the libraries are developing new roles which are totally compatible with the mission of the DPLA. And it's certainly not in any way a mission that is undercutting libraries. I think exactly as John said, it's supplementing them. And that's one of the, its most important functions. This suggests another. And we don't have time for many more questions here, but a closely related theme, which you mentioned parenthetically, is the changing role of librarians in this environment. Um, June, you have been um, enormously helpful to me and to many of my students, many of whom are here, in navigating this altered information landscape. Uh, so could you speak to the general issue that Bob raised, namely the changing role of librarians in this new environment? Um, I think that I will say certainly within the past six years that I've been at Harvard Law School Library, my role has certainly transformed in terms of increased skills in terms of being a digital librarian. I wasn't a coder. I am now a very sincere coder um, in terms of looking at metadata. It's not just helping people how to search, but it's actually now 
creating the sources, the digital sources, so that people can, you know, can use those sources. Right now, we're, we're planning a very exciting digital project related to open access to law. And, you know, basically, it's, that's what gets me up in the morning, is the, the idea of making sources available in a digital realm for people that, like Bob describes about, I'm not thinking in terms of Harvard Law School Library having access to the sources that you know, I want to create now, to want, I want to digitize and make publicly available. I want them to be available to the world. I want them to be available to the people in the small African community that doesn't have the resources to purchase materials. I want them to be available in the small public library that I see in Iowa or in New Hampshire where people go to use the library for the sake of the computer. So I think in terms of my role of librarian, it's not just in terms of my small Harvard community, it's to a much broader digital community. So. Well, I think that's actually a great note to end on. We've exhausted our time. Um, so uh, as I mentioned at the outside of this session, this is the last of the episodes in several parallel ventures, most importantly, the Harvard Law School course and the Copyright X course. Um, and appropriately, the lights are beginning to go out. Um, both will happen again in about a year. Um, but for the time being, the venture is over. Thanks to everyone for your patience and your engagement.